Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and if you have rich friends, you'll find out why you should from today's guest as we welcome from AmplifyMyWealth.com, Alyssa Mazes. Today, we also welcome the man who's always amplifying your wealth from LenPenzo.com, Warren Buffett. Actually, Warren's a little too young for today's roundtable, so we picked up Len Penzo. Plus, a man who's rich enough that people should want to be his friend, and yet, it's OG. But that's not all. We'll then include a special segment with Suzanne Lucas, the evil HR lady, about why Elon Musk should have fired all those people at Twitter, but not in the way that he did. And now, a guy who amplifies your wealth every episode, it's Joe Saul Cihai. Hey there, stackers, and happy Friday to you. I am Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Doug, happy Friday to you, my friend. How's it going? Thanks, Joe. Great day. Looking forward to the weekend. I know. So am I. Well, you know what? Way before the weekend, I'm just looking forward to this discussion because we've got a heck of a panel lined up, as you so graciously told us. And I think this is a great topic. We're meeting all kinds of new people this month. A lot of us where we've got new acquaintances, maybe want to uh, explore some new friendships. We'll talk about how those all work. But first, let's see how our panel works across the card table from me. It's my good friend, Mr. Mr. OG, it's getting close to your birthday, man. Thank God. It's you, you got the birthday list already. Uh, it doesn't matter because um, all of my, none of my friends are rich. So, <laughs> well, we're going to change that today. We are yes. going to change that today. Uh, and by the way, were you naughty or nice this year? Yes. <laughs> Correct. And deep under Los Angeles, it's our friend, Mr. Len Penzo's here. How are you, dude? I am fantastic. And I know I know OG said, it, you know, talking about things doesn't matter, you know, but frankly, we're talking about all this wealth already about wealth, wealthy friends. You know, it really doesn't matter if you're rich or you're fat or you're poor or you're tall or you're thin, because at the end of the day, Joe, it's night. <laughs> no, 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 no. That one doesn't work today. You played that one last week. We need this one. Oh, gee. <laughs> there we go. That's the one we need. No. Yeah. Oh, he's here all week, folks. Tip your weight, staff. He's been <laughs> hoping for that one all day. And we're so happy she's back with us. She has not been on the podcast yet, so it's about time we got her here. We have talked to her. If you hang out with us on Instagram, Alyssa Mazes, Amplifying Your Wealth. How are you? Great. How are you doing? And well, happy I'm birthday, OJ. Uh, thank you. In a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know why he doesn't have more friends. I can't figure it out with all that personality just coming right out. Alyssa, you not only have a financial planning practice, great practice in Southern Florida, where you and I got to meet face to face. I was so happy we got to meet when I came to South Florida. But you also, you know, Clubhouse lately for a lot of people has been like a mess. It's either really good or really bad. And I think one of the great places at Clubhouse was the chat that you had all the time. Are you still having your Clubhouse chat? So I did take a little break. Um, I have not been as active on Clubhouse as I had been, but it's been a great place because I've been able to share financial literacy tips with so many people I otherwise would have never had a chance to connect with. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, no. So, but people do want to connect with you on Clubhouse because I know the people that are on Clubhouse absolutely love it as, as long as they know the right places to go, right? So how do they connect with you there? So on Clubhouse or any social media, my handle is at Amplify My Wealth. And tell everybody about your practice as well. So I am a licensed attorney, although I don't practice law, um, as well as a registered investment advisor. And I help 
especially women and young adults who tend to not seek financial advice until after they wish they did. Um, I tend to help them the most and putting together a financial plan as well as giving them advice that embraces the life that they want to live. Yeah, starting off with with their goals first. What's what's frustrating is so many people are like that. You know, you talk about people don't get a plan until it's until you know way after they should have. I felt like when I was a financial planner, Alyssa, that was that was usually the case. Like people were like, I should have done this five years earlier. Definitely. I mean, I see that a lot. And especially I feel that for young adults, it's a huge advantage because they are starting fresh. And while some of them might have some debt from school, most of them are in a relatively good place. They don't have as many responsibilities usually. So it's a great time to start. So this way you're on track to not have those regrets. And with women, they do tend to take care of other people more than themselves throughout their lives and often neglect being in charge of their own finances. So that's why I'm especially passionate about those two things. And understandably, women especially feel that connection to speak to another woman. They feel a little bit more confident sometimes. So I'm grateful to be there for them. Well, I'm glad that in the last couple of years, I've upgraded my friends to include you. And we're going to talk about that today. Do we need to upgrade our friends? Is it time to do that here at the end of the year? We got Alyssa here. We got OG here. We got Len. We got Doug. Our piece today that we're going to reference a little bit, but you don't need to have read it to uh, play along with us here. If you're listening to the show or watching us on YouTube, comes to us from uh, monovator.com. And you know what? We'll link to it in our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com if you do want to read along while we're discussing this topic. But really, all that all that I'm worried about is that this this piece really made me think a lot. And Len, you know uh, Munavader, the blogger at Munavader, and have been reading uh, his work for quite a while, I think. Oh yeah, we uh, been for a long, long time. When we, I think we both started about the same time, probably 14, 15 years ago. So uh, yeah, we've uh, we've gone back and forth and exchanged emails in the past, and and uh, yeah, he's a good so, guy. Alice yeah, yeah, I think so too. And this is definitely a very thoughtful piece. So let's talk about upgrading your friends. Alyssa, I want to start with you. Have you ever found that you suffered from having the wrong friends? Not from like, I got to get away from this person because they're toxic, but just net worth wise, they were digging a hole and bringing you with them. So it's an interesting question because I definitely feel, first of all, you don't really know what someone's net worth is because a lot of people live as if they have a huge net worth then they might not. But I have made an effort to stay away or not be as close with people who I feel are focused on living large and spending lots of money, that that's their identity of what makes them happy because it's not how I live my life. I'm more of the millionaire next door kind of person where I'm a minimalist and very intentional with my money. So that's definitely what I have focused on in my life. Len, it's interesting. I think Alyssa makes a great point there about knowing what somebody's net worth is. So I guess asking that question a different way, is there, have you ever found you suffer from having the wrong friend spending wise, like the way that they spend money wise, maybe didn't fit with your values? Uh, yeah, I'm with uh, Alyssa. I, I'm definitely a, a minimalist too. I live well below my means. Um, so sometimes I don't tend to get along well with people who, who, are free spenders, regardless of if they have the net worth or not to support it. It just doesn't, it just doesn't coincide with my lifestyle. So, um, I try to, I try to avoid the people who, who are always saying, Hey, come on, we're going on a, you know, we're going on, who knows to some far away place, you know, a great two week vacation, come on with us. Or they're constantly going to concerts and spending these huge amounts of money for things that, you know, it's just, I can't keep up. I'm not, or at least I'm not willing to keep up. So yeah, that can be kind of, it can be dangerous, I think, especially for someone like yeah. me. Yeah. Do you find that, do you find that Len, you find that specifically because you don't want to keep up with the Joneses? You don't want to be on that, I guess, rat race? 
Yeah, I've never I've never been that way, you know, wanting to keep up with the Joneses. And, and I think I've mentioned before, I hope none of my neighbors are listening. There are a few neighbors on my street who I know. I mean, they live. I know they live way beyond their means because they've got all the external uh what would which I call signals of wealth that they'll have, like the fancy cars and, and they're yeah. constantly changing those cars out. But I know for a fact that like when you when I go in their house, they haven't upgraded anything in their house since they moved in twenty five years ago and they're living, you know, a really a tight existence otherwise. So you, you know, I, I do know the people who want to want to put up appearances when they really can't uh they can't afford it. Oh, gee, Lens, you and I Lens, know. Lens researching the uh, Lens researching the uh, lien filings of all of her, all his neighbors. <laughs> Did you just get a home equity loan? <laughs> hey, I saw. can't live next to you, you slime bag. <laughs> hey, uh, I pulled your credit. Yeah, yeah that'll go over good at the holiday party in the yeah. neighborhood. <laughs> it's like here's all your credit what has scores. Three digits and begins with a five. Let, let me just <laughs> say a credit score. <laughs> but, but I sure hope my neighbors aren't. I hope my neighbors aren't listening because let me just say I, you know, I've got a modest vehicle, and I know I've uh, 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 compared to some of my other neighbors who have very expensive vehicles, and I, I just know they're in worse shape than I am financially. So there, well, I'll leave it at that. But does that does that go the other way, Len? Do you see them staying away from you because of the fact that they think that you're not wealthy enough? Uh, I don't know, and I don't care. Okay, yeah. I, I really yeah. don't. I, you know, if they stay away from me, fine. Because you know what, that they're. Um, you know, I guess that's fine. I'll, I'll, I, although I thought I had good relation, I do have good relationships with all my neighbors. Maybe after this podcast, I probably won't. Oh, gee, you, you and I, um, we should, we should talk just for fun to all Len's neighbors <laughs> to listen to this. <laughs> Len honors all of you. <laughs> Did you show. know your neighbor is a world famous <laughs> blogger and podcaster? Check out his most recent episode. Happy holidays. <laughs> yeah. Merry <laughs> Christmas be, from the Penzos. Just, just be great. Oh, gee, you and I know a, uh, a financial planner like this who, who will say out loud, he will tell you that he is more interested in you thinking he's wealthy than whether he is wealthy or not. You know exactly who I'm talking about. And I don't know. I it, 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 yeah, it, it, it just drives me crazy. What about you? Have you ever found you suffer from having the wrong friends net worth wise? Every week. Oh, beyond. Oh, Joe, net worth. Why wise. would you have just teed that up for him, Joe? That? I knew that. I, I had that one ready for a long time. Three He's times like, a is week. Is this a three wood or a driver? I can't tell which one exactly I'm going to swing at. how teed up this is. Bump Sorry. that spike. Yes. Um, no, I. I don't. I don't know that I um, have ever consciously thought about it, but but I do know that there have been times where when I, when I think about like what people are going through, because being in the money business, you know, you can't help but notice like kind of what Len's saying, you know, you kind of can keep an eye out for some of the behavior type things that just make you go, huh, that's weird. Um, one of my favorite, um, uh, memes that I've seen uh, over the last couple of years is, you know, you know, remember the daytime talk shows with the, you know, it's like, you are the father. Yeah, you know, Mari or, Povich stuff. Yeah, you 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 uh, you said that uh, you did not, you know, go out with this person, and yet the pregnancy test says you did, or something like that. And one of the one of the one of the memes that I saw said, uh, you know, you borrowed a thousand dollars from me and said you'd pay it back next week. Your new Xbox says you're not going to, or something like that. And and. And I think that, you know, you kind of see that, whether it's that behavior of, you know, borrowing money and then you go, okay, but I thought you just refinanced your house to get out of debt. How did you end up at the furniture store? You know, you, cause you kind of, you kind of pick up on those things. People say like, oh yeah, I just refinanced my house. You go, huh? Okay. wonder why, like, you know, not really a good time to do that or something, you know, you just kind of, yeah. kind of piece it together. And, uh, and I do think you have to somewhat pay attention to that because, you know, the, the, the people that you hang out with the most are, are gonna, gonna reflect on, on, on what you do in your life. So you, I think you do have to be careful with it or at least cognizant of it. 
Len, I want to go back to you because, you know, you were talking about ostentatious, you and Alyssa both talking about ostentatious displays of wealth that you really don't like. But you know what? This is not our first rodeo, I think, for any of us. And you can truly, I feel like a lot of the time, my this is baloney meter, you know, OG, to your point that, yeah, I'm seeing all these signs that you aren't what you're pretending to be. Um, when somebody truly is wealthy, and, and you you pick that up like I feel like there are some th- ways that wealthy friends can help you like they can show you listen to your point. They can show you that, hey, I can have this money and I don't have to spend it all like I can use it for these things that are really important to me or I can invest. Right. I mean, a lot of people that we talk to or that listen to our show, they're afraid to invest and wealthy people like, no, that's the easiest thing ever. And if you surround yourself with those people to say investing is the easiest thing ever, well, then you just jump in because everybody else is doing it. It's like I, I ran zero marathons until we moved to Texarkana. And then I started hanging out with runners and now I've run 11, right? And there's a direct correlation between who I hang Weird out flex, with and that stuff. Okay. Yes. Look at that We're right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, but Len, when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to wealthy people, uh, having wealthier friends, what wealthy friends have you had in your life that have really helped you with confidence and with growing your net worth? Well, I, I've referred to him before in the past as my cousin, my cousin, Kevin, the CPA, the retired CPA now, but he's, he made, he's very, he led a very successful life while he was a CPA. And he always used to give me little words of advice, um, constantly telling me, reminding me about the power of money uh, versus today versus its value in the future. Um, and, you know, basically a, do- a penny saved. I mean, all of his words were always, you know, a penny saved today will will pay off more in the future. Uh, don't ever spend. I mean, these are basic. Don't spend uh, more than you than you earn. Uh, you know, indentured debt leads to indentured uh, servitude, you know, just certain things like that. And how he managed his own life. He is a person who still to this day, although he's well into, I know, a seven figure uh, net worth, maybe eight. He lives a very modest, controlled lifestyle. And that was, you know, I looked up to that and I used that as a role model for me. So I knew that even though he was, a, you know, making good, good money, he didn't, he didn't overspend and he was very uh, reasonable with how he spent. And so I just soaked that in like a sponge and I used him, like I said, as a role model. So, Well, Alyssa, wealthy role models you've had, how have they helped you? Um, so a few things come to mind. One is I, in my free time, I love um, helping non-for-profits raise money uh, for causes that I care about. So I have reached out to people that are wealthy and told them about the causes that I care about, and they have donated and supported those causes. I feel very comfortable asking people. I'm not asking for money for myself. I'm asking to help other people that need help and would benefit from it. So I think that that's definitely the first thing that comes to mind. The other thing is for people who are truly your friends, because I feel it's one thing being surrounded by wealthy people, but it's another thing is to have true friendships where there's a respect. Often you can ask their opinion about different things that they've experienced and learn from their insights. So I feel that that is the other way that I really have benefited from not necessarily their net worth, but their experience, because on their way to attain that net worth, they had certain experiences that I haven't had. So I feel that that's a great way to benefit from it as well. But are, the, but are there some habits, Alyssa, that you have to this day that you learned from somebody that was wealthy, who, like Lynn talked about, was a mentor to you? And, and if so, what was that habit that you still have today? So similar to what um, Len shared is my grandmother grew up during the depression and she was very intentional with her money. And she went from that to um, living a very comfortable life and passing away just before she turned 100 and being able to have options, which is what I see as the greatest benefit of wealth 
is to have options in your life. So I learned to be intentional with my money. Um, and also I think about my parents who my mom obviously learned from her mom as well is I remember if there was a less expensive alternative, for instance, a vacation, we would go to Mexico while other people were going to different islands that were a lot more money. And so that mindset of you can go on vacation, but there are different ways to have really nice vacations, whether it's using your points and miles, or it's finding a a less expensive alternative, um, that there are just different ways to live your life and still accumulate wealth. Well, and you're, you're the same with your vacation. You go to a place off season that you absolutely love for your vacation. I know you've, you and I've, I don't know if we talked about it in the podcast, yes. but we've certainly talked about it before. Yeah. We, we, uh, honeybee and I, we, uh, go to, uh, we go to Maui a lot and we go in the off season, um, usually in the summer or uh, very late, very early fall. Um, and there's less people there. I mean, it's not the perfect, obviously most people want to go there in the winter time, but uh, by just by going in off season, we save so much money. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's basically half off if you're just willing to, if you're willing to go in an off season time of year. So, so that's kind of a nice thing to, to do. Yeah. To save, save money and still enjoy it. Have a good time. But what about people that, you know, they really, they really lend, um, I think there's some people listening to this and they're like, well, I don't want cheaper. I want things, I want things good. Do you feel like sometimes you're cheapening the, the trip? No, I mean, the value of the experience, it's the experience. It's not, the experience has nothing to do with, with how much money you've, you know, spent that, okay, you could have spent twice as much money going to the same location that doesn't take away from the, from the experience at all. Um, in fact, it may add to it because, um, if you're going to a place that's half off going by off season, you can actually do more at that location yeah. with, with the, with the money you're saving. If you think about it, you might, you might be able to get, you know, 25% more vacation just by going in the off season. Len, I went for one of those half off sales once and we got halfway through our vacation. They knocked on the door and asked me what I was still doing there. And I was like, what's going on? And they're like, well, when we said half off, we were referring to the length, not the price. <laughs> Sorry. Do we need to... <laughs> we, can, we can cut that, right? Do we, cut... <laughs> do, do we have to move on? Floor. Do we have to move on? That was great, wasn't it? I thought that was good. Uh, Fix it in post. OG, how about you? Wealthy friends, mentors that have taught you things uh, over the years? I think, um, like Alyssa was talking about, my, my grandparents were a great role model for just about everything in life. Uh, my grandfather was an entrepreneur, and, and uh, you know, I learned a lot from that. But I also think it's important to have people that are either, like, one or two steps ahead of you. You know what I mean? Like... I remember this uh, sales manager that I had <clears throat> early on in my career, uh, two, as a matter of fact, one very early, like long before financial planning. And um, she was just such a such a uh, great influence in terms of possibility. She was not a great influence in terms of like behavior, like she was, <laughs> you know, a drinker and a partier and like all that sort of stuff, but did so, you know, because of the success that she had in her job. You know, was like, hey, if you work hard, this can be you. I remember going to dinner with a sales manager early in my financial planning career, and um, <clears throat> we we're all around the table. And he reached into his pocket and pulled out, you know, this piece of paper that was all crumpled up and kind of un unfurled it in front of the entire group. And it said, you know, it was a check for twenty eight thousand dollars or something. And you know, he's talking to a bunch of twenty three year olds, and he says, I get one of these every month. Yeah, you know, I just kind of crumpled it up, put it back in his pocket and was like, oh my gosh, it's possible to be, you know, to be successful and, and, uh, from a monetary standpoint. So again, not a great, not a great role model for, for other things potentially, but, but just kind of having the ability to say, or to look and say, okay, I can, I can see myself being in those shoes, you know, if I do these things or if I behave in this way, you know, in terms of in terms of doing the right thing, you know, I can be financially successful or kind of like at that next level, whatever that looks like. So I think those things are, those things are super important, you know, 
a lot of people look at Instagram and and get like the FOMO thing, right? Like, yeah. oh, I can't, you know, my favorite Instagram follow when I was still on Instagram was Yellowstone Club. And not because it was like, oh, you know, those rich SOBs or, you know, or, or, or like the FOMO thing of, you know, I could never, I could never, you know, be there. It's more like, okay, so there's another level. Like it's just 10, 100, you know, thousand levels beyond me, but, but it, you know, there's another level. I, I don't have to be, I don't have to be complacent or satisfied with, with, with where we are right now in our, you know, financial life. There's, there's other things that can, can happen beyond that. Well, to second, to second that, what I love about our friends that we've talked about before a year of my experience with strategic coach, which you, you recommended that I do is, is that, that, that it's what Alyssa and Len are talking about with controlling the controllable when it comes to your expenses, but also realizing there's an income side that I can expand. And it's the combination of the two. If I can build a bigger gulf between those two numbers by driving yep. income up and keeping my, my my values in check and Alyssa I love the phrase you use to spend intentionally right that it's that that uh that I think that um that for me that was like the big aha surrounding myself with those and surrounding myself with all these people who have done it before as a business owner being at these meetings once a quarter where everybody's doing or they've done what I'm trying to do just gives me confidence you know that hey this isn't as hard as I as as I thought it was I want to I want to ask you one more question before we go to the break. And there's a there's a P, there's a story in here uh, in this piece about a, a violin player, and it's about a young woman who t- took uh, who was great at violin, did phenomenally well. In fact, she did so well that everybody agreed that she was being held back because of the fact that she was this big fish in a small pond, and she needed to be with people that were ahead of her about the violin. So she went to these elite classes and she was absolutely miserable it was absolutely horrible she's surrounded with these amazing violin players but now everybody's taking it way more seriously than she wanted to take it i felt like you know she could have changed uh monovator says that 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 she could have changed her outlook to match those but it wasn't really what she wanted in life and i feel like Alyssa, sometimes when we think we want new friends it it becomes I don't know. The phrase when I read this was beware what you ask for, right? Uh, like just surrounding yourself with richer people might not be, Alyssa, what, what we want it to be. No, I definitely agree. And I think I really felt for her too, because as a child, I felt for her that the adults in her life didn't think about who she was as a person and whether it was the right fit for her. And I mm. think that that's a very unique situation. Sometimes we think our kid is really great at something and legitimately great at something. I don't mean, you know, the delusional parental moment, right? But we really think they're good at something and we have to speak to them and figure out if it's the right fit for them. I, my son actually did, um, he, one of my, both of my kids learned how to play piano. One of them com- decided he wanted to compete. He liked it because he's not a very competitive person, except with himself. It was a perfect thing because you get ranked on your performance, not against other people. And so when he was really little, he did that. And then I noticed he wasn't practicing as much as other people. And I, I sat down with him and I said, if you're not going to practice, I'm going to understand that you might not want to continue doing it this way. You could still do piano, but not this way. And I think so many times people are making decisions for their children and not thinking about what's best for them. And I think that this, either the parents or other adults should have been more um, mindful of what is best for that student. And they clearly weren't, unfortunately. No, yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that when it comes to our wealth as well, we say, hey, guess what? I'm going to upgrade my friends. I'm going to change. I'm going to kick out the old friends and go to new friends. And it's not at all at all what we what we thought we wanted. We're going to come back to this in the second half. I'd like to talk to all of you about your suggestions. If we do decide, you know what? I need to... (laughs) 
I need to say goodbye to a friend. Can't wait to hear Len talking about this. How do you, the way he talks about his neighbors. Can't wait to hear this one. How do how do you say goodbye to a friend that might not be the right fit? And where do you go to find these friends if you're looking for uh, quote upgrades to your friendships? But first, I read as a lot of longtime listeners know my friend Suzanne Lucas, the Evil HR Ladies blog, and she had this very interesting take on Elon Musk and Twitter. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. She's about to do her European theater debut as uh, the fairy in Little Red Riding Hood. Before she starts, we got her here. Suzanne Lucas, the evil HR lady's back. How are you? It's been too long. First of all, it's been way too long. It's been way too long. Way too long. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Congratulations, by the way, on the on the part. Is, is there going to be like a, is there a Broadway thing coming here, Suzanne? Something to tell us? Are you changing careers? Well, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be my pathway to a Tony. Um, yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> yes, which which is, by the way, the start and the end of the EGOT, right? So you're you'll get the whole EGOT. The the yes. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, y- you wrote a piece for Inc., uh, which everything you write catches my attention, but this has been a big one, and I'm glad we have you here a little late on this because I wanted to wait for all the hype to to go down, a lot of hyperbole to abate before you and I had this discussion. But your piece says, this is your headline, Elon Musk was right to let people go at Twitter, how he conducted the layoffs was all wrong you write employees needed to go but it's worth it to slow down and choose carefully i want to take both sides of this suzanne i want to start off with first if you're somebody who is letting people go and then second if you think you're going to be let go especially in tech as you've read fifty thousand layoffs last month in tech certainly not a huge number for the entire economy but in this one sector a lot of these big name companies shedding a lot of their workforce so i want to ask you about that too but let's but let's start here You say this, when conducting layoffs, it's important to remember you're eliminating positions, not particular employees. So while it may have been satisfying for Musk to terminate certain people who spouted off to him on Twitter, it's not the best idea to do that. Let me ask you this. He owns the company. Why is it not the best idea to go, hey, you want to fight with the boss? See ya. Um, (laughs) So it's not a good idea to fight with the boss. First of all, I don't blame him for firing people that are making Twitter look bad and making him look bad. That's just dumb behavior to go on social media, any social media, whether your boss owns it or not, and say, my boss is an idiot. That's a bad idea. But when you're lowering your workforce, when you are doing a reduction in force, which is what he is doing here, because he said, look, there's Twitter is bloated, and I absolutely believe him. Twitter was completely bloated. It needed to have a massive layoff, which is the same thing that happened, you know, Facebook and every place else that these tech sectors got huge. Um, But you need to think about what you're doing and who you're terminating and why you're terminating them. And when you start thinking about people instead of positions, then you get yourself into the situation that Musk found himself in Um, which is having to rehire a bunch of people that he laid off and ticking everybody off. It wasn't a thoughtful, well laid out layoff. It was like a throw darts at the wall layoff. Yeah, and, and, and you don't just complain about this. You actually then proceed to have a structured system. If you're thinking about letting people go, that you should use. You've got three main points. Do you mind walking us through those? Sure. I mean, the thing is, is that whether this is the exact way you want to do it or not, there's, there's plenty of right ways to do it, but it needs to be structured. You need to think through it. So the first thing you need to do is think about um, how does this position move the company forward? And so sometimes, of course, the answer is it doesn't. Um, and, you know, not necessarily for, for Musk, I don't understand the inner workings of how Twitter actually works, but, you know, if you're, if you're a widget manufacturer and you're no longer going to make gray widgets, then it makes sense to eliminate all of the people on the gray widget team. That's, that's an easy way because that position is not going to move 
the company forward. But um, for in Musk's case with Twitter is before you can eliminate a position, you need to say, what does this position do? How does this move the company forward? How is this position um, really helping us? And if it's not, then it's time to let it go. If there is an answer to that question, then that takes you to the next step. And you need to ask yourself, what would happen if no one was in this position? And this is yeah, really- and, and, and actually, Suzanne, I want to stop there for a second because you'll see this quite a bit, won't you? Where companies will get rid of, let's say, R&D capacity. Well, if you get rid of research and development capacity, how the heck are you going to grow in the future? I think that's what you're saying. We need to find a way out of this. And if we are, if we're bailing people that help us tomorrow, but don't help us right now, it's going to be more difficult to find a way out of this death spiral. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why you need to really sit down and think, um, which is with this next question, what would happen if no one was in this position? So we eliminate R&D. That's a huge cost saving. Whew, they're all gone. But now what? Um, you know, the company can't develop any new products. So are we happy with what we have and we're going to be happy with that forever? Um, you know, and a lot of people are like, well, gosh, what does HR do? What does marketing do? What, do, you know, does Twitter really need any marketing people? Because everybody already knows it exists, right? Um, so you have to ask yourself, well, what will happen if we let those people go? And you need to see what they do behind the scenes and not just what your perce- perception is. Because with a lot of these um, support functions, whether it be HR or marketing or finance or whatever, you just see the end thing and, and everything's running fine. You know, everything's good. Why do we need someone in HR? Everything's good. Well, <laughs> it's good because they're doing the work and they're doing it quietly behind the scene, keeping things from blowing up. Um, and so you, you know, you eliminate those people or you're going to end up being with lawsuits. You're going to you eliminate too many finance people. Are you going to run afoul of SEC regulations? You know, like what can possibly happen here? And if you can't answer that question and what you're going to do to replace that person's function, then you're probably laying off the wrong person. You know, that's kind of an I love what you... Yeah, I love what you say here. HR consultant, employment attorney, Kate Bischoff likes to say, HR is like the CIA. If we do a good job, you never know we're there. And frankly, I feel like in some of these layoffs, Elon maybe should have had an HR person standing next to him while he's making while he's making some of these moves. Because I've seen some of these lawsuits. I mean, some pretty prominent people that he let go of, he's been forced to rehire. And how, how uncomfortable is it for him to have to still have this person that he let go still in the company? Right, right. And to be fair, when you have a mass layoff, that happens a lot um, because, you know, we can talk about this when you ask what do you do to prepare for a layoff. Well, one of those things you do to prepare for a layoff is you start looking for a job and so you find a new job and then the layoffs happen and you're not laid off. Well, maybe this new job is better and you go anyway and then now they need to hire someone back. That's pretty normal, but it happened at such a high volume and so quickly, this wasn't, (laughs) this could have been prevented. You asked third, are there functions that can be combined? So if you're getting rid of something, maybe just lesser the capacity by, by merging two together. Right, right. And this is something that Musk said um, himself, that he said that it seemed like that there was 10 people managing for every person coding. And I'm sure that's a bit of hyperbole, but I'm sure it's just a bit of hyperbole. I'm sure that there was many, many layers of management. And that's something that you can do is like, okay, who can we eliminate? What levels can we get rid of? What can we do to make this more um, cohesive and combined? You know, do we really need um, uh, this person over this product and this person over this product or can they come together and have that be one person? And if they can, then that's a great place for cost cutting um, to be able to do that. The, the key thing with all of this, though, is you need to be able to answer these questions before you go ahead with the layoff. And I don't think you instead that. of no, instead of at midnight, 
it, the carnage just just begins. Let's let's flip this, Suzanne. I think that uh, there's a chance in 2023, or heaven forbid, here in the holiday season, I'm going to get laid off. Um, what what are the what are the things that I maybe need to start doing? Well, first thing is get your resume up to date. And um, one of the things that is very difficult for people, generally our brains only go back about three months. So when you're like trying to list your accomplishments and remember resumes are about accomplishments, not about tasks. If anybody says, you know, uh, responsible for, yeah, well, my kids are responsible for cleaning their bedrooms. That doesn't tell you anything about the state of their bedrooms, right? <laughs> Responsible means squat. So you want to say cleaned my bedroom every day. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Actually, one of my kids does. I have two kids, one who cleans, one that doesn't. Um, but um, so whenever you think of the word responsible, think of your children's bedrooms. And then that'll remind you that that's not a word you want on your resume. You want your accomplishments, but people don't remember your accomplishments. So before you're terminated, before you lose access to your company email and your company files, go through it and see what you accomplished while you were there. And forward anything that you need to your home email that's not gonna violate company policy. You don't wanna like steal company secrets and then end up in jail. But you wanna make sure you have copies of your performance appraisals. Um, because especially if those are electronic, or in a filing cabinet or something, you won't be able to access those easily. You'll want those when you're writing your resume. You're not going to want them to give oh, them to a, somebody, but you'll yeah, want Yeah, that's them. a good point. You you may get locked out before you even know that you're gone. Yep. Yep. And especially in IT heavy roles, you know, people talk about it being rude, but if I've just fired you and you're angry and you're a coder, I definitely want you out of the systems before you can mess everything up, right? So it's just, I mean, that's that's standard practice in, in many, many industries is once you're notified, you're locked out of systems. So they're not going to give you a chance to go through and get the phone numbers of your contacts or whatever that is. Um, if your phone is a company phone, um, you're going to lose email addresses, phone numbers for all of these people. And granted today in the age of social media, you can probably find them again on LinkedIn or whatever, but still it's better if you've taken that. So you want to cover your own behind and start looking for jobs and, um, and also be prepared to help your colleagues because either way you're going to lose your job or they're going to lose their job. You want to be friends with everybody because that's how you're going to help you get a new job or you're going to help them get a new job and networking needs to go two ways. So make sure that you can help others. When, when do I start thinking about um, severance negotiation or thinking about like my Cobra uh, package? Do I get all that together as well immediately when I think this might start? Well, they, the Cobra information will come to you um, by law. They have to give it to you. So you don't okay. need to worry about that. It'll come to you probably in the mail. They should give you a lot of that information when they're notified. But when they did these mass notifications like at Twitter and like at Facebook, they probably did. I know they didn't at Twitter. I don't know what they did at Facebook. Um, that will come later. You'll be eligible for unemployment. Anybody laid off is eligible for unemployment. However... Um, unemployment is a state decision, but severance is a company decision. And there's only a very few situations where severance is required. Now, in the case of the terminations at Twitter, because he didn't give notice and there were so many people affected, here severance is required for 60 days in order to meet the Warren Act. And, and people, I keep hearing that Musk has violated the Warren Act. He didn't because while he terminated the employees, they're still active employees in the system. They're just not working for 60 days. That meets the qualifications of the Warren Act. Um, but you're not eligible for unemployment until the end of those 60 days if you're being paid during those 60 days like those people are. And for any severance on top of that Warren period, um, 
The company can't stop you from getting unemployment at the same time, but they can in most states. Let me just qualify because there's 50 states with different rules. In most states, they can say, oh, well, if you're getting unemployment at the same time you're getting severance, we'll deduct the unemployment from your severance. So that is something they can do. Um, So what you probably want to do is wait until your severance runs out to apply for unemployment. But check with your your paperwork. Um, it'll it should say in there. You'll be given if there's any sort of severance involved. You'll be given a document called a general release that will go through all of your rights and all of that, everything that you're signing away to get severance. Go ahead and take it to an employment attorney. Um, and have them take a look at it before you sign it. In a group severance situation, you do have time. Um, If you're over 40 in a group severance situation, you have 45 days in a single one, you have 21 days. People under 40 don't have a guaranteed time, but I would be shocked if they didn't give them at least 21 days to review in a group thing. If they say you have to sign it without seeing an attorney, don't sign it, it's not worth it to you. If they won't, if they don't want you to see an attorney, then it's not. That then you probably uh, should see. Then the you attorney. should see an attorney. So yes. I've had so many people say to me, "Well, I'm going to talk to my lawyer," and I say, "Great, I really recommend that you do that." As a matter of fact, here in the document it says we recommend that you speak with an attorney, and they go, "Oh," and then they sign it right then. <laughs> <laughs> We got that covered. You should. Yeah. No, that's that's great advice as usual. And I love that insurance. And I feel like people, you know, almost like on a, we hear horror stories all the time when people say, no, I don't need the home inspection when they're buying a new house. Ah! When, when you're getting this severance, when you're making one of these big changes in your life or you're changing employment, it sure, an attorney is expensive, but it's far more expensive if that ends up being, you know, there ends up being something in there that really could cost you a lot. And and the, the, the bigger thing is, even if it feels like a waste of money, Suzanne, like the best news is you take it to an attorney, attorney says there's nothing wrong. Like that's what you're truly hoping for. Right. Is it is that everything's on the up and up and no, this is good. Right, exactly. And, and you want to know precisely what you're signing because some of them may be really simple. Um, you know, you're waiving your right to this, 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 but it's pretty obvious and it's fine. You know, you say I've, I've, they don't owe me any more money for um, travel reimbursement. That's often something that you sign that you say I've received all of that. So if you haven't received all of that, you don't want to sign it. If it says um, that you have to do a non-disparagement Um, You can't say anything bad about the company. You want to know that before you sign it. And is the company obligated to non-disparage you? That's something that you can say, hey, look, if I'm going to be nice about you, you have to be nice about me. Um, Oh, that's fabulous. A two-way street. Yeah. Yeah. You want to make sure that that's a two-way street, that they're not going to do, turn around and say bad things about you. It should say something along the lines of what your reason for termination is, that it's a position elimination and not a for-cause Um, termination. So you want to make sure that those things are clear and you want to make sure you're not signing away anything that you don't want to sign away. Like if you have been sexually harassed and you want to file a lawsuit on that one month of severance is probably not worth signing away your rights to sue. Um, So you'll want to double check with an attorney on, on those things. And it's definitely worth your time and money. And I've heard people say, oh, you should negotiate your severance. If you're one of 3000 people at Twitter being laid off and you're not a senior vice president, there's no negotiation here. It's sign or don't sign. If you're one of three people being laid off in the 30,000 person company, yeah, there's negotiation possible. But when they're terminating 50% of the company, it's a take it or leave it situation, unless you're really senior. They're just gonna laugh at you. We'll link to this piece on Inc. Brilliant work as usual, Suzanne, uh, on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. But if you want to hear some of the most bizarre and interesting and fun and weird and cringy and uh, textured and nuanced and I don't know how many words I can use, Suzanne, (laughs) discussions about HR – 
go to the e, go to evilhrlady.org your blog where uh you dive into some of this stuff holy cow the stuff you you've gone through over the years i'm like really this happened in real life really it's <laughs> crazy huh <laughs> i know uh hey that's all fine and good have a happy holiday season though and even more than that good luck in the off broadway debut thank we'll you, see you in new you. york i'm sure in a few months absolutely Welcome to the second half of our discussion about rich friends and poor friends. And Alyssa, second half of the show is brought to you by Magnify Money. You know what happens when you go to stackybedjamins.com slash Magnify Money? No. <laughs> she, she's like, I don't want to. I, I, I was waiting for you to try to pull what Len and Doug did to me earlier. Thank you for not doing that. You'll find that those brick and mortar banks that most people bank at might not have the right financial products. Over 92% of all financial products out there, whether it's online banks, brick and mortar banks, all ranked head to head against each other. So you can find that it's easy to find a best in class checking account, savings account, CDs, whatever it is for your emergency fund, stackybedjamins.com slash magnify money gets you there. And it's good. We, we actually had Trisha who told us last week that she saved, uh, I should have had that in front of me, but she saved a bunch of money when she went to magnify money, which was cool. I love it when stackers write to me and say that they like these companies that we hand chose. Magnify money has been with us for, for a long time. OG, maybe what? Eight, seven, eight years, seven, eight years. What a while. Yeah. Yeah, quite a while. Uh, so for those of you that for some weird reason tune in to the halfway point of the show, <laughs> what, what, what you don't know, we've been talking about rich friends and poor friends. Like who listens to a podcast that way? So l let's get to some answers here. We talked about why this is important and things you can learn from the right. I think the key here might be the right wealthy friends. But Alyssa, let's start with you. How do you temper what you accept from rich friends is helping you with wealth? Like I feel like you must have have some strainer, right? Like I'm going to, okay, this wealthy person says this, I like it, this thing I'm going to let go. Um, I actually appreciate anything that people share with me. What I actually use is a whole nother thing. It has to be something that aligns with my values. There are definitely some people I know who are wealthy that do things that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing. So I would say they have to align with my values and also what my goals are in life because increasing your wealth um, could be important for sure, but I might have other priorities and maybe what they're doing doesn't align with that. So I would say values and priorities would help me filter the information, but I love information from anyone. I think of any, um, any amount of wealth, I love learning. So I would definitely welcome all the information and then figure out what aligns with my life. I, I love, Len, that uh, Alyssa starts off talking about kind of her North Star, right? Her values, because I feel like she's talking and I'm hearing you. I'm, I'm just betting <laughs> that you're probably 100% on board with what Alyssa's talking about, about the place to start. Yeah, I, I am 100% on board with that because what you got to do is you got to... Some people, I guess everybody's wealthy for different reasons. And if I'm going to pick the brain of a wealthy person, I, you, you, I wanted to pick the brain of a wealthy person who kind of, like Alyssa said, has the same values as I did. For example, you know, I don't own my own business. I, I know wealthy people who've, who are wealthy because they started their own business. I know wealthy people, though, who have worked for the man their whole life and they became wealthy because they invested properly and they saved over time. I know wealthy people who um, are relatively, I won't say extremely wealthy, but they're comfortable simply because they're very good at saving and spending far less than they've earned over their lives. They're the millionaire next door types. So it kind of, like Elizabeth says, you got to look at what your values are and then pull from the people who share your values. Um, I think that that's, you can leverage that to your advantage that way. If you're a saver and you're not into starting your own business, you really, you may be making a mistake trying to emulate the wealthy person who got wealthy by being an entrepreneur and, and starting his own business that way. So. Oh, gee, you're around uh, wealthy people uh, often. How do you temper what you take from them and learn and what you leave on the table? I think that success in different areas leaves lots of clues. And 
And while it may look a lot different to the ex, you know, to the external person or the external party looking at it, like Len, you said entrepreneurs who are wealthy may look a lot different than somebody who worked for a major corporation and saved money. But there's a lot of similarities there. And, <clears throat> and I think if you get the opportunity to interact with somebody who is, you know, a station or two above where you happen to be, and from an a aspirational standpoint, that's directionally where you want to go. I think you can look at some of the things that they've done or groups of people like them have done and um, and learn from that or not done, I think maybe is another key component, you know, like, for example, uh, one of the things, Joe, you and I have talked about a couple of times, um, we tend to see that wealthy people don't have mortgages. And especially later in life. Right. And that kind of goes against rich dad, poor dad. And it goes against, you know, the, the, the idea of arbitraging the interest rate and all that sort of stuff. It doesn't mean that that can't happen. Right. It doesn't mean that if you're going to be a real estate investor, you can, you know, you, you have to pay all your stuff off. I'm just saying that in working with hundreds of people who are approaching retirement, the vast majority of them don't have mortgages anymore. That's a clue, right? Like you can kind of go, huh, maybe I should kind of follow some of that, some of that same, some of that same logic. A lot of wealthy people don't use consumer debt for anything ever, you know, regardless you of points. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then you see people are like, oh, well, yeah, I just <laughs> I was talking to somebody today and they're like, well, you know, as soon as I get my Peloton paid off, then I can look at that other thing. And I'm thinking, first of all, I know how about how much money you make based on your occupation. So why, why, what are you waiting on to pay off your Peloton? <laughs> Number two, isn't it 2017 called and they want their <laughs> exercise equipment back? <laughs> wow. <laughs> there goes our p potential Peloton sponsorship. Right I love there. my Peloton. I'm just, I, I just still use it all the time. But <laughs> my point is, is that, you know, I didn't realize that people were still financing them. <laughs> like, yeah, like, right. You know, like they're two grand. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big number. I get that. It's not, it's not an insignificant check to write to, to get a piece of exercise equipment, regardless of the brand, but you don't see a lot of wealthy people going. So this is, uh, you know, three years, same as cash, right? I'm gonna go get a new bedroom set and I don't have zero interest for, you know what I mean? Like you just pay for it. If you don't have the money, like Len, you were talking about live below your means, you don't, you don't buy have the money. You just don't buy it. You you know, so I think success leaves clues. And, and if you can kind of lump some of those successes together, look at what those clues are, uh, that, that definitely points you in the right direction. Doug, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about mentorship and about surrounding yourself with the right people. And I feel like, uh, even in your career, some of this translates, right? Uh, wealthy is in terms of career success. Like there are things people can learn and not learn about their career. So when, when you, over the course of your successful career, as you looked at, uh, looked at, you know, people that were quote wealthy in their career, how did you, how did you synthesize what you took and what you left on the table? Well, you know, a lot of the, the friends that I have who have been very successful were not necessarily successful in the corporate world, uh, at least financially. They were successful because they were entrepreneurs in, in one form or another. But so it wasn't uh, it, there wasn't a direct correlation to what I was doing. But what I was able to take from them was the way they handled their interpersonal relationships and or their business relationships and the way that they communicated. Um, it, it tended to be more direct. Uh, I noticed that they asked for things that they wanted and or expected without trying to beat around the bush about them. So I, I tried to emulate some of their their communication styles and the, and the way they carried themselves, not necessarily some of their specific actions because they were they weren't as applicable. Maybe I just wasn't open. I wasn't opening my eyes to them from an entrepreneurial standpoint versus a more of a corporate ladder standpoint. But uh, I just I just looked at the way they conducted themselves and realized they're more direct than a, than a lot of because they have to be. If, that, sure. if that's how you're going to run a business and that's how you're going to um, accumulate success and wealth, whether it's you're buying other companies or you're, you know, you're trying to get clients, you just have to be direct about that stuff. You don't have time not to be. And so that's that's what I tried to to glean from them. 
Well, I love how that correlates, Doug, with what, you know, we had John Bowen on last Wednesday talking about how communication mm-hmm. is a skill and about how if you can get your point of view across, like that opens the road to not just wealth, but opportunity, no matter what it was. I mean, the story he told about the guy that finally got parole from prison because he knew how to communicate when he'd been denied over and over, but then he went and joined Toastmasters and got out like right away because he could finally tell his story. Like I love, I, I think that's a joint Toastmasters. That's that's awesome. a, it was, it was such a, it was such a great, great story. Like you wouldn't think if about joining the guy Toastmasters. Shawshank Redemption had gone to Toastmasters. He wouldn't have had to dig a <laughs> hole through the wall. Well, I think first, I think first there is back to Alyssa's point. There is a values thing, right? There is a, what you value piece. Uh, so Alyssa, back to you. Let's say that you got to say goodbye to somebody. There's people that are listening to this going, you know what? I truly got to say goodbye to these people. Len's thinking about getting rid of his neighbors right now as we talk. So um, how do you, how would you say goodbye to some of these people that aren't right for you that maybe you've got let get too close? So right now I'm thinking of a couple that we really, really loved. They were great they are great people and they work really hard, but they just spent so much. We would go to a restaurant with them and they would order not just an entree for each of them, but then multiple appetizers. Sometimes they'd order three entrees for them and they're not very big people just to like put, you know, paint the picture. It's not that they eat a lot, but they just wanted everything. And it was something that I just couldn't relate to, especially because I volunteer in a food pantry a lot. And the idea that then they weren't even taking the food home. I'm just, it was being thrown out and I really liked them. And there were so many things I liked about them, but just gradually after giving it a few tries and seeing if it would be any different, we stopped seeing them. Um, so I think if there are people in this case, they were definitely not toxic people. Sometimes there are toxic people and I approach that the same way. If there was nothing that they did that was wrong that I need to speak up about, it's just a matter of phasing them out of your life. Uh, I think just kind of ghosting them. No, not ghosting them. If they were reaching out to me, I would definitely respond, but just gradually phasing them out. If I see them in the community, I'm still, you know, excited to see them. I like these people, but these are people that are just not really having, they don't have the same values that I have. They're great people, but just, I can't relate to them the way I'd like to relate to the people I spend time with. But I guess that's my question. How do you phase, quote, phase them out? Do you just not volunteer to do stuff? If they volunteer, then it's great, but you just don't volunteer to do things with them? Uh, Basically, it just, I think a lot of people are pretty busy with their lives. I haven't been, and I think most people can read the signs anyway. Um, So I haven't really had trouble with that. You know, sometimes it takes longer than other times, but I've, been able to do it without a problem, without a hitch. I have family members that I know won't listen to this because I've tried to get them to consume any financial media for a long time. And I I can't figure out why, like they would like all these people, they would enjoy the stuff. And I don't know, in their head, they think it's going to be horrible. And um, I'm struggling with the fact, same thing, Alyssa, I'm struggling with the fact that the decisions they make, but they spend a lot of time with me talking about how they can't do any of the stuff that that I do and, and how they wish they could. And I look at the decisions they make cause I have a front row seat and I'm like, this is a product of your decision-making and the fact that you don't think at all about your money and you don't think of it. And whenever you try to bring it up, no, 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 no. I can't do anything. Yes. Oh, it just drives me crazy. Well, and the worst part of that is that it's not even like, boy, I wish I could. It's more like, well, must be nice to, oh, must you be nice got to be that able to go your family. Yes. Yes. You've got that in your family, OG. Because I work really hard. So uh, that's what I'm going to do now. How do you, have you had a situation outside of your family where you have to say goodbye to the not so right uh, person? Um, No, I don't think so. I mean, I think different people come into your lives at different seasons for different times. And, you know, those, those uh, relationships kind of ebb and flow. That and, friend that uh, that friend that mutual friend of yours and mine that I referenced at the beginning of the show, I did frankly have to kind of ghost him 
Like he's, just he's written me twice and I just didn't write back. I'm like, I, I just can't, I, I don't know. I can't really yeah. talk to you. I just believe that you have to be intentional about who you're spending time with. And, and if things aren't going directionally in your life, the way that you want it to, you know, other than looking at yourself in the mirror, I think if you look at the people that you're, you're you've surrounded yourself with, um, at work or, you know, at play, you can kind of quickly start figuring out like, oh, you know, no wonder I go out to eat all the time. I hang out with people who like to go out to eat, you yeah. know, like yeah. Alyssa, you were talking about or something, you know, it's like, well, that's, that's affecting my ability to exercise and lose weight and you know, whatever. It's like I, I, four times a week, I'm going out to, out to dinner. It's like, that's going to have an impact on that. It doesn't make it wrong. It just, I, I think you have to be aware of kind of what you're, what, you know, where you are and what you're tr surrounding yourself with, because you can make those changes and, and, you know, move in the direction that you want to move in. Last, uh, last question I have is if you decide that you want to quote upgrade your friends and, and, and be surrounded by wealthier people, uh, uh, how do you do that? Uh, just very briefly, uh, Len, Len, you want to hang out with wealthier people. What do you do? Uh, well, if you want to hang out with wealthier people, if you can find one, you know, birds of a feather tend to flock together. Um, usually if you, if you find one and you start getting into that circle, uh, you'll eventually, you, you'll meet other wealthy people. It, it kind of just, it grows on itself. So if you can start hanging out with that wealthy, other wealthy person, uh, you know, at parties or lunches or what have you, I guarantee you, you are going to bump into uh, other wealthy people. And, and let me tell you, I think one of the most valuable things you can grasp from any of the wealthy people, truly wealthy, not the people who spend more to, you know, put on, yeah. use yeah. the term ostentation is, is the networking and the contacts. I think that is the most valuable thing you can get from the wealthy. Um, if you can meet those other wealthy friends and leverage those contacts, I think uh, that'll help you in the long run. Well, and I love that, Len, if you start with what you said earlier, which is somebody that you value, right? Somebody that, that shares your values first, like not somebody who's wealthy and does things differently than you do. Start there. They're, they probably have already surrounded those, themselves with people that are like them. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Doug, how about you? You know, I say use your kids. I mean, <laughs> they... <laughs> Look, when they're young, they just suck the life out of you, right? I mean, they're just all take, 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 take. So you might as well get some benefit out of using them. So, uh, you know, kids' sports and uh, their schools, I think, are the it's, – it's just a natural networking place. You have a thing in common to talk about when you're together, and it sort of breaks down that typical socioeconomic barrier that would be there otherwise. So either get your kids into sports leagues in – neighborhoods and areas that might have more affluent people or maybe even you know try to to get them into the school in your district um or, or maybe even a private school i mean as as superficial as it sounds it works it gets you access to those people in a in a very casual environment uh that allow you to build some 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 friendships we're in the we're in the season where everybody's watching uh, uh the the Christmas Carol and Ebenezer Scrooge and I think Doug uh, like you know please could you spare a dollar please but please could you network with my daddy please could you just, yeah. just spend <laughs> a couple minutes with my I'm father <laughs> hey Johnny go be friends with Chad <laughs> because his dad is bank <laughs> be friends with that guy yeah. <laughs> Uh, Alyssa, I like what you said earlier about volunteering, because what I found is that often people that are wealthy, that, that, that really share those values that you're talking about, about being community oriented and they, they tend to spend time volunteering and giving to these local organizations. No, I have met a lot of people that way, not with that motivation. Sure. What I like a what I like most about it is that on your worst day, you feel good anyway. It's not just about who I'm meeting, although I've developed some great relationships with people by volunteering, but it's also feeling good at the end of the day, no matter what, you're doing something good, you're giving back, so it's always a good day. And then if you make some great friendships along the way, it's like the cherry on top. 
Yes. No, I, and I wasn't questioning your motivation for, for being oh, on no. these cruises, but I will tell you, in my experience, when I went there, a happy thing that happened, a surprising thing that happened was I was surrounded by some very wealthy people that were giving their time. These people I thought had no time were the people that were giving their time. I, I totally agree. And the other thing that I have found in the food pantry um, that I had been volunteering at for years is that when a lot of wealthy people are done working, you know, when you talk about retirement or financial freedom, whatever it might be, they still want a job and they love volunteering and it's like a job to them. They take it just as seriously. They put just as much passion into it. One person in particular I'm thinking of, he is the soup man and at the pantry, he's in charge of soup when he's there and he's excited to see what's available that he could use to make his soup. I mean, it is, and the thing is, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you all connect over the fact that you're volunteering together to make a difference. And I did not think for a second you were questioning um, why I did it. I was just saying for people who maybe haven't volunteered that know that you can walk away feeling great and it, it might take time to develop those relationships, but no matter what, you're doing something and you're making a difference and it's not costing you anything if you're volunteering. It's a great time of year to build that muscle, too, if you're looking for community. Truly, the spirit of this season, I think, is definitely community. OG, how about you? Uh, how do you enter into these circles with wealthy people? Well, uh, as Doug has pointed out so many times, I don't make a lot of friends. So thankfully, I happened to see my daughter brought home something from school the other day from first grade. says, how to make a friend. So Aww. she gave me the instructions by, <laughs> by Caroline. Out of every, by the way, is, is it, 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 Doug, is it lost on you? It's not lost on me at all that out of every member of the family, she'd give it to her dad. <laughs> Here's how to make a friend, dad. <laughs> just so step just one, <laughs> let you know. Step one, there's a little picture of Caroline. First, say hello to someone. Nice. Step two. Now there's two people. Next, ask to be your friend. And three, let's play with them. Yeah, perfect. So that's how I, I would love do it. it. I would, I would just say hello to someone, ask to be their friend, and go play. If Wanna hypothetically. <laughs> If hypothetically you were trying to get a friend, yeah, right. <laughs> if hypothetically I needed to get a friend. I think I think that's a great place to, to, to leave it, which is uh, advice from Caroline on, on getting friends. Hey, uh, if you'd like to dive into this even more, you'll find this uh, motivator piece on our show notes page at Stacking Benjamins. <laughs> Dot com. Let's talk about what all of you are doing uh, during this holiday season. OG, what do you got going on this weekend, my friend? Oh, my goodness. Kids are done with school. So uh, we are trying to decide whether or not we're going to get up to uh, Michigan to see the family this week or not. Just kind of depends on uh, some some family moving parts, so to speak. But um, otherwise, just uh, just laying low and uh, seeing what happens. Uh, seeing what happens. That's all I can say. I don't know. Excellent. Out, Letting it. Christmas cookies, trying to stay, oh. stay thin. I scheduled my, I scheduled my, uh, annual physical on January 6th. So there is some significant motivation to keep it under control, to keep it under reasonable <laughs> control for the next, uh, the next couple of weeks. I like how he, your approach to this is like, as long as I just clean it up right at the end, <laughs> I right. should be able well, to just squeeze. Well, let me rephrase. I don't know whether or not that will work. That's what I. That's what I'm down to. I don't have a choice at this point. It's, this sounds. It's this not sounds like, like I can go back in time. This sounds like Len. Uh, Len, how many times do you floss before you go to the dentist? 
Uh, if you floss like three days before you go to the dentist, uh, the, yeah, they don't the, even know. The hygienist will will swear that you've been flossing the entire six months. It, 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 try it, try it, folks. You're gonna you're gonna love it. I know. It. I, I I I would concur with that statement. It is your gums could be bleeding like days four days before you go. You could be, have your teeth could be getting loose. You floss for three days, floss in the morning and at night for three consecutive days before that hygienist appointment. The the hygienist is gonna just she's gonna be showing you to all the other doctors, all the other dentists in the room. Look at this. And that's guy. what and that's what this is all about, kids. Your trips to the dentist is just to fool the hygienist. <laughs> that's the only reason you go. Your annual physical in your mid forties is all about like trying to skate under the whatever number it is that they think you need to just like Boy, uh, the liver enzymes are really good. You must have dialed back on your alcohol consumption. I sure did the last three weeks. Yeah, that's right. But but this meeting is going too long. I got to get out of here. Right. Exactly. Like the date at the bar. Yeah, the shakes, but at least uh, my liver looks good. Well, Len, speaking of you, not only do you have a uh, maybe not uh, great view of flossing, but what is your what's what's going on at LenPenzo.com? Well, lenpenzo.com, we've got uh, a story on uh, ways to save money at the uh, at the vet's office if you have pets, uh, ways to save money. And uh, I, also, I've, you know, we do have the eight ball episode coming up. So I have been practicing the eight ball. I've been working him out, hoping he will uh, good. You know, come come up with some some good stuff. So just real quick here, because he's he's been he's been uh, he's been practicing. I think he's getting on. But let's just ask real quick. Uh, eight ball is the sky blue is the sky blue it is a certainty see we are on baby are on. <laughs> oh look at that fantastic and that's coming up eight balls could talk i'm talking to, i'm getting mine from the wrong people <laughs> <laughs> that's coming up at the beginning of next year everybody the first friday in january our eight ball episode we're going to find out how good it did last year len if it uh had yeah. another good year like the year before or not for those of you new to the show we ask a uh, lens kmart or not kmart walmart purchased eight ball questions about the financial future and then a year later we see if it was correct and the first First several years we did this it was unbelievably correct just wow the eight ball was amazing and then it must have started drinking to oh yeah. geez point because there were a couple of years there that weren't good just to be clear here joe we're talking about one of those magic eight ball toys right yes absolutely okay. uh, did, uh, you got it at len did you get it at walmart i i think i bought it off of amazon actually but what what the hey Yes, Walmart same thing. The internet. Did you get the invoice for that, by the way, Joe? I'm still I, I, I have on not. That. Okay. No, no. You gotta, I do. I think I owe you for the eight ball. I think we've gotten some mileage out of your eight ball. We totally have. That you stole from your kid initially, I think. Yeah, <laughs> Alyssa, thanks so much for joining us. It was so fun that we finally got you here. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun too. Well, tell me what's going on with you. What's going on with your practice, with your online chats? So, um, like I said, I'm not on Clubhouse as much, although yes. I'm hoping in the new year I'll be there more. Definitely a bit more time on Instagram. And I am also really excited because I'm working on a new annual subscription package um, that I'm launching in the new year. So really awesome. focusing on things that are top of mind of people right now, which I would say definitely recession issues, inflation, market fluctuation. These are things that people are definitely speaking about more than they had before. So in gratitude for having a seat at the round table, any stacker that mentions um, the podcast would receive an additional hour um, of one-on-one -on -one advising with me oh, if they awesome. choose the annual subscription package. So just wanted to share that. And thank you again. I've had so much fun. Oh, fabulous. And thanks for that offer. And by the way, anybody uh, who wants that, we're going to have a link on our show notes page to Alyssa and uh, amplify your wealth at stackingbenjamins.com. All right. I think that's, that's going to do it for today. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Doug, what should we have learned during this episode? 
Well, Joe first, take some advice from Alyssa Mazes and our team. Start with what you want first and then decide who your friends will be, unless you prefer being miserable. Second, when it comes to firing people, maybe there's a better way. And if you found out you may be losing your job, there just may be some homework you should get started on ASAP. But the big lesson, oh my God, Alyssa's company is called Amplify Your Wealth. I tried to magnify it and holy Benjamin, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> see, get it? The, the magnifying glass and then the, see what I did there? You take the magnifying and then the sun, the holy, anyone? Okay, let's move on. Thanks to Alyssa Mazes for joining us today. Check out more of her work at AmplifyMyWealth.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at StackingBenjamins.com. Thanks to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find Len at LenPenzo.com forward slash dental scams. Thanks also to OG for joining us today. Looking for good financial planning help? Head to StackingBenjamins.com slash OG for his calendar. I always have to take a deep breath before this next part. <laughs> Here we go. This show is the property of SB Podcast LLC, copyright 2022, and is written in part by Paulette Perhatch, who helps writers power their words, their work, and their earning potential with her Powerhouse Writers Coaching Program. The next session begins January 24th. Find out more at powerhousewriters.com. <gasps> Thanks also to our team who made today possible. Karen Repine plotted out our episode for us and schedules our guests. Brooke Miller handles the show notes and creates our amazing newsletter, The 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show, and both Autumn C.I. and Gertrude Smith are our social media mavens. Not only should you not take advice from these turkey giblets, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before taking, excuse me, before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Started to get lightheaded here. You almost made it. Almost made it. <sighs> What's that trophy, OG? It looks like you finished fourth place and you you ate soccer. <laughs> no. That is the trophy of champions. Two-time reigning. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah. Yeah, well, what, what are you going to refill club, with your own Hershey's Kisses? I'm going uh, <laughs> to have the company buy me some. Yeah. <laughs> An expense. Expensive bag of Hershey Kisses. Yeah, Len, look at that trophy. I know. It's quite a stout on. The problem is there's a little spot you know that you can write on there. It says OG with a whole bunch of stars on it, but it wiped yeah. off. Yeah. So I got to get well, another you, dry erase. You should erase put my name there. on it for the first two years. Because you've only now attained a level that I've already been to. Finally You're catching right. up. <laughs> Finally catching up. Thank you for letting me catch up. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> They're not competitive at all, Lissa. They're not competitive at all. All right. <laughs>